Welcome everyone, uh, new and old friends. We are absolutely delighted to be together in person again. Um, my name is Marian Casey and I'm a historian on the faculty here at NYU. Um, tonight is a landmark event in the Glucksman Ireland House public events um, calendar, the annual um, Ernie O'Malley Lecture. And my charge this evening is very brief. Um, first, to please silence your phones now, if, if you haven't already done so. The second is just to let you know that there, we will have questions, uh, we will take questions afterwards, and we'll pass mics in both rooms. And finally, I have the pleasure of introducing our generous benefactor, Cormac O'Malley. Uh, Cormac is a prolific author, editor, curator, and lecturer, and that's only since he retired. Um, and he's a longtime champion of Glucksman Ireland House and the former president of its board of advisors. He's also a visionary supporter of Irish American studies, a field that has truly come into its own since Glucksman Ireland House was founded 30 years ago this spring. Um, he made possible um, this field by uh, supporting the Archives of Irish America in Bope's Library, the American Journal of Irish Studies, um, that's our annual journal, and by the endowment of this pioneering annual lecture, which showcases the best emerging scholarship in the field. And tonight is the 24th in the series. Thank you, Cormac. And to tell you a little more about the genesis of the series, um, please welcome my very good friend, a very smart and kind man, Cormac O'Malley. Uh, Marion, thank you. And indeed, it's great to be back at home in uh, Glucksman Ireland House. Uh, when I joined the board back in 1998, one of the questions I asked was, uh, why does an institution as great as uh, Glucksman Ireland House uh, concentrate on Irish studies? And um, because uh, I'd married an Irish American and I got to know a little bit about Irish America, just enough. Um, and I uh, said, you know, this is something that we should also look at in the academic world. Uh, we had a, um, a committee of the, of the boards uh, went out to look at it. And it ended up as sort of saying we should do it. And though there were classes at that time starting uh, with, uh, with Bob and others uh, who were just looking at uh, Irish America, but it wasn't a feature. So um, what I did in 1999, and I think Joe Lee, who is here, uh, our second director, uh, gave the uh, uh, lecture, <laughs> the inaugural lecture for the uh, O'Malley. And what Joe challenged us at that time was to look at the future uh, of all of the issues. And it, I think it still stands as a magnificent work, Joe, that uh, of the things that we should be addressing as uh, we look at Irish American studies. Anyway, that's, uh, uh, it was uh, in honor of my father because he came uh, to get away from Ireland in a certain sense, and he had a whole new life over here. And so as uh, Glucksman Ireland House was looking to the start of its life, I wanted to give the opportunity for Irish uh, uh, and the academics in America to give um, uh, an analysis of Irish American history and other matters. So that's the genesis anyway, and I'm glad it's been going 24 years. And welcome to those who have given. Uh, 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 Kevin has given, and we look forward to it tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Kenny, director of Glexham Ireland House. Uh, we will eventually get to our speaker, uh, but first I have to in <laughs> introduce uh, uh, my uh, very good friend and fellow historian of American immigration, Tyler Anbinder. Uh, Tyler is a professor emeritus of history and former chair of the history department at George Washington University. He's the author of three award-winning books of historical nonfiction. His first book, Nativism and Slavery, um, remains the standard interpretation of the Know Nothing movement of the 1850s, of the relationship between slavery and anti-immigrant sentiment, uh, winner of the Avery O. Craven Prize from the Organization of American Historians. His second book, uh, Five Points, 
I think if I read the subtitle, it'll explain what the book is about. Uh, the 19th century New York City neighborhood that invented tap dance, stole elections, and became the world's most notorious slum. Um, his third book, City of Dreams, The Immigrant Experience in New York from the First Dutch Settlers to the Present, is a sweeping history of um, immigration in the world's great uh, immigrant uh, city. Um, Professor Anne Binder has won numerous awards for his scholarship, held numerous fellowships, was a historical consultant to Martin Scorsese uh, for the making of the Gangs of New York. I can attest to that fact because after I watched that movie, and it's a long movie, I watched all the credits. And uh, Tyler, your name was uh, late in the credits and it was there. Um, Tyler's uh, great, if, if I can call it, um, slipping to the colloquial, Tyler's great uh, strength as a historian, because I know his work so well, is his ability to conduct arduous, painstaking work in the archives and then write up his results in a lively, engaging form that is accessible to a wide uh, public audience. And he often tries this out first in scholarly articles that lead to some of the books I've mentioned. In leading venues such as the American Historical Review, provides really detailed accounts of the lives of Irish emigrants before they crossed uh, the Atlantic from places like Kerry to Five Points in New York City. And then when he gets them here, his work really uh, challenges so many of the standard assumptions uh, we have uh, about Irish immigration. Through systematic analysis of the emigrant savings bank uh, records in particular, as we'll see this evening, um, Professor Ann Binder is able to demonstrate not only the surprisingly high amounts of money that people put by and sent home, from ostensible dens of iniquity like uh, Five Points, but also uh, the jobs they worked at and how these positions uh, changed over time. In other words, he is able not only to measure wealth, but also to track uh, social mobility. And he tells this remarkable story in a forthcoming book, Plentiful Country, the Great Famine and the Making of Irish New York uh, will be out with Little Brown and company this time next year. So you'll have to come back uh, next year to, to launch the book and we'll, we'll um, uh, do that then. But um, this evening, uh, we're privileged to get a sneak preview uh, of this book, Plentiful Country. Um, having read uh, much of the manuscript over the last several years, um, as it was being written, uh, I can assure you that what you're about to hear is a lecture filled with surprises and one that um, turns many aspects of an older but still dominant picture of Irish America on its head. Welcome, Tyler. <laughs> Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Get a little set up here. I forgot. The same. You can use Same tiny lectern. I feel so. I actually gave. I don't know how many people have been privileged to give this lecture twice, but I was here in 2002 and talked about five points. So that was two books ago, and now just standing here, I remember how little this lectern was and how, how complicated it was. Um, but let's start right in. John Lane and Dennis Sullivan were similar in so many ways. Both were born here on the estate of the Marquis of Lansdowne in County Kerry in Southwest Ireland. Yeah. You guys can't spot down bottom there, bottom left, that little dark spot on County Kerry, that's the Lansdowne estate. Both survived five years of famine there, witnessing the deaths of hundreds of their kinsmen and neighbors. Both emigrated to America in 1851. Both of them settled in New York City in five points. John at 31 Baxter Street, which is that tall brick building there amongst the little ones. 
and Dennis around the corner on Anthony Street, which is now Worth Street, and then at Six Little Water. So if you look on that little map there, uh, Dennis Lane was first in that building that's labeled E, and then in that building that was labeled C. So kind of catty corner to uh, John Lane, who is in the big building labeled H on the map there. Both, after arrival, became day laborers, working primarily on construction sites. Soon, however, their lives diverged. Dennis remained a day laborer for the rest of his life. He worked in that capacity until age 70 when he retired, and he died still living in that neighborhood just across the street from 31 Baxter Street uh, at age 80 in 1880. Lane, on the other hand, only worked as a day laborer for about five years. Then he opened a saloon in that very big, tall brick building at 31 Baxter Street. He moved the saloon from location to location over the next five years to various places on Baxter Street, trying to get a slightly better space, a slightly better rent. Eventually, though, he moved uptown to 357 West 16th Street. Uh, he bought the entire tenement at that location, put his, installed his saloon there, and began renting out the apartments there to earn additional money. Lane did so well, both as a saloon keeper and as a landlord, that he was able to retire before age 50. And he called it retirement. He wasn't uh, sick or anything. He said, I'm retiring. Um, and for the last 20 years of his life, he lived off the rents paid by those who uh, leased his residential and retail spaces. So which case is more common? That of Dennis Sullivan, the lifelong day laborer, or that of John Lane, the day laborer who went on to bigger and better things? People have been arguing about this question ever since the end of the famine, uh, when this question became a proxy uh, for the fight about who is to blame for the famine. Uh, the English, uh, when questioned about the, the famine and the results of it and the, the, so many people leaving for uh, Ireland for America, said the famine was a good thing for the Irish. Look how well the Irish are doing in America. And of course, uh, those in Ireland would tend to reply, no, this was, and they'd use words like an extermination, uh, things of that sort, and, and that the Ireland had been you know, depopulated because of what uh, the British had done. Now, looking at the letters that the Irish wrote home, uh, and there aren't that many of them, um, because a large number of the Irish uh, who came to America could not uh, read and write, but the letters that do exist and that we're, uh, are still extant tend to, tend to make the argument that life in America was good. As one put it, quote, any man or woman are fools that would not venture and come to this plentiful country where no man or woman ever hungered or ever will and where you will never be seen naked. Yet historical scholarship on the famine immigrants typically gives a different view. The most often cited work on the famine Irish uh, in America, that by Kirby Miller, who I remember was at the talk when I gave my talk on five points here 21 years ago. Um, Kirby described the famine Irish in America as living, quote, gloomy lives filled with deprivation. In general, the famine Irish experience in the New World was one of poverty and hardship. And then in terms of whether or not the Irish immigrants in America were able to move up the socioeconomic ladder or not, Miller said, quote, the great majority of famine immigrants seldom rose from the bottom of American urban society. What upward occupational mobility there was for the famine Irish, he said, was usually slight. So that would lead us to believe that Dennis Sullivan was the norm and John Lane was the outlier. And of course, I, to some extent, have contributed to that view, writing about five points, this neighborhood where um, everybody seemed to be poor and nobody seemed to be able to improve their lives. Now, my book would have said probably not much more than that had I not met Marion Casey in about 1998, so that's scary, 25 years ago. I was down, I remember very vividly, I was at the New York Municipal Archives on Chambers Street, and they knew what I was working on, and I was there a lot. And, and I was told, and one of the archivists or somebody who was there said, you need to go talk to Marion Casey and learn about these bank records that they've discovered. 
And so I went and I met Marion, and we were just talking about this, and she told me the, the origin story of how the Emigrant Savings Bank records made it to the New York Public Library. And I went and looked at them, and that caused me to change the ending of my book about five points. And so whereas that book originally kind of was, this was terrible, and it stayed terrible, and it was always terrible, it, in the end, the, I changed the book because of that material, because the emigrant bank records showed that the famine Irish who lived in Five Points were actually saving a good deal of money and often moving on to better jobs and better neighborhoods. And so I added that to the book at the end. And that was too late to make an impression on Martin Scorsese, who, as you heard, I, <laughs> I, cons I helped with in a very small way with the gangs of New York, and I, I told him, you know, everybody didn't live such terrible lives. He's like, oh, that, that won't sell. That, Hollywood, Hollywood won't buy that story. And so that didn't make it into Gangs of New York. All right. So um, I decided, and, and these records are, the Emigrant Savings Bank records, are just fascinating. And so it's all Marion's fault that I've spent the last 20 years <laughs> working with these records. Um, and just one thing led to another. And they're just amazing records. This is, what you see here is a, uh, a, a page of what are known as the test books. And they're called the test books because in addition, so you can see there, um, um, in addition to having the person's name and their account number and their occupation and their address, which all banks took down in those days. It has all this other information that's down at the bottom of the screen there. And so I, I've blown it up a bit. So those of you, I'll show these people in this room and in that room, follow along. No, I know, but I'm going to point here. So it says you're reading from the, at the bottom there, it says native of Rahud, six miles from Kel, Kells, where the Book of Kells is from, county. Now it says County Westmeath, but he was really from Meath. Um, Ireland is in U.S. five years next Christmas. So that's the end of the top line. Per the ship C, that's the name of the ship he came on, the C, from Liverpool. Father dead, Philip. Mother, Catherine Regan. One brother in New York, James. That's the end of the second line. Four sisters in New York, Anne, Jane, Mary, Ellen is married, wife Mary McFadden, no children. So now you might ask, well, that's a lot of interesting information. And if I was a descendant of Peter Lynch, I'd certainly want to know those things. But, but you might wonder, why do I care about those things? Why did those things matter to me? Well, besides making for good stories, because you know that's just fabulous detail, and you can do so much with that. Um, Marion students have done a lot with that on the, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, uh, the stuff that her students have put online about, uh, they're based very often on, those, on these bank records. Um, but one of the things I became interested in was this question of to what extent were the famine Irish upwardly mobile? Um, because I found in five points they were a lot more upwardly mobile than I thought. And so was it possible, I wondered, that this whole stereotype that the famine generation was stuck in poverty, that they were fated to be poor because of discrimination, lack of education, lack of financial resources, that they came to America poor and they stayed poor, and any improvement in the lives of Irish Americans would come from their children. And I found in five points that didn't seem to be the case, so I wondered, uh, was that the case? Um, you know, were five pointers an exception? It didn't seem possible, but so I wondered about that. But what these records allow you to do is to find out the answer to that question. And here's why. So let's say we wanted to track Peter Lynch and find out how he ended up doing. So here he is, uh, if you look. Right here, just above the middle, he's Peter Lynch, age 30, Mary, age 26. And there are, what we know from the bank records, are his sisters and his brother. And then over here on the right, we've got down at the, towards the very bottom, Peter Lynch, laborer from the 1850 census. 
So let's say we didn't have the bank records and we wanted to know what became of Peter Lynch, the day laborer who had come from Ireland. How could we figure that out? Well, we see there in the 1850 census he's married to a Mary. A lot of, a lot of Irish immigrants married to Marys. <laughs> so here we go on to Ancestry.com and we can see there are 26 Peter Lynches who are about the same age as our Peter Lynch. How can we know which is the right one? Well, you might say, well, let's look for one married to a Mary. And that makes sense, but of course, Mary could have died between 1850 and 1860, so there's no guarantee that, that he'd still be married to a Mary. But let's say that we decide to, to narrow just to Mary's. On the right here, we have one of those records in Ancestry.com that Peter Lynch, married to a Mary, became, was a farmer in Minnesota. It doesn't look like this is the right one, though, because you can see there on the bottom right, it says he has a child named Ellen. That's not Elon like Elon Musk. That's a misspelling of Ellen. So that's probably not him. Here are the three other Peter Lynches married to Marys. The one on the left lives in Troy, New York. A lot of New York Irish moved to Troy eventually. Um, this one's a laborer. He's married to a Mary. They have no kids. The age is about right. So that could be him. In the middle, we have another Peter married to a Mary. They have a lot of kids, so it's probably not him. Though I I've had cases in my research on this book where I found someone married to a person with one name. That woman dies. They marry another person with the exact same first name who comes with stepkids. So I have someone who, in one year, has a wife with no kids, and then 10 years later has a 14-year-old kid and you think this can't possibly be them, but it turns out they are. But probably not. And on the right, we have another possibility. That's a Peter married to a Mary. They've got three kids, but those kids are all under the age of 10. So it could be that all of a sudden, Mary started having, they started having kids. Now, given what we know, it's unlikely that they'd be married for seven years before, or looks like eight or nine years before having kids. But Again, you never know. But the truth is, we don't know which Peter it would be, if it's one of these. So we just have to give up. We can't trace this Peter. We can't guess, because then we maybe would, would mess up. But the bank records allow us, in a lot of cases, to figure out who the right Peter Lynch is down the road. In this case, I, I figured this out through, uh, you know, just, uh, I don't know if, if any of you have done uh, genealogy stuff, and you get into this stuff, and it's really hard to stop. And you're just finding records, and could this be them? I don't know. And you, you look and look. And so I ended up, of all places, the 1885 Minnesota census. Because I was trying to see whether that one in Minnesota with the daughter, Ellen, could that really be the right one? And I found, um, if you look down here at the bottom, there's Peter Lynch, and he's living with an Anne, a Jane, a Mary, a James, and an Ellen. And then I remembered the name of his siblings. And I remembered the order of those sisters. And right, because down here at the bottom, here are the sisters, Anne, Jane, Mary, Ellen. And here are what appear they could be sisters, Anne, Jane, Mary, Ellen, in that exact order. So I thought, huh, maybe this is the right one after all, that one we found in 1860 in Minnesota. So the nice thing about tracking the Irish in small town America is there's a lot more stuff online. So this is, on the right, is from Find a Grave. Do you guys know Find a Grave? It's just a great resource. And so what do we have here? Peter Lynch died April 1891. Where is he from? He's a native of Rahoud County, Meath. And they're sharing the same tombstone. It's his wife, Mary, who had died in 1877. And that explains why she wasn't uh, in that 1885 census record. Now. There could actually be more than one Peter Lynch from Rahud. I have come across things like this. Rahud only had 97 people or something. But I've come across cases where places this small have people with the same name, married to people with the same name. But if we do one more bit of research, another nice thing about small town America, you've got sources like the County History of Sibley County, Minnesota, which says has a little biographical sketch of Peter Lynch, who is married, it says here, to Mary McFadden. And so now we know for sure this is the right Peter Lynch. So that was a lot of work to make one link to find the life story of one famine immigrant. You do that a 1,000 times. In my case, I've done it 1,200 times, just to be sure. 
And that's what this book that I've written is based on, is the lives of these 1,200 or so people who I've traced um, and their families who I've traced over the course of their lifetimes and kind of created a, a kind of group biography of the famine Irish in New York and to some extent in America too because as uh, I'll mention at the end, a lot of these people will live in New York for a while and then go move somewhere else. Now, one question we have to ask ourselves briefly and that I get asked all the time when, as, as uh, Kevin points out, I give these things at scholarly meetings is, how do we know these immigrant savings bank customers are really representative of the famine immigrants? So I'll just briefly talk about this. One thing that's worth noting that you guys might not know is that, and might not imagine, is that we know that about half of all New York families had bank accounts in the 1850s and that the Irish immigrants were actually more likely to have bank accounts than native-born Americans. And I think that may be in part because the Irish tended to live in tenements. Tenements in those days did not have locks on the door. So you didn't want to keep much of value in your apartment, especially if you had saved some money. So Irish immigrants had an incentive to open bank accounts and keep their money in them. Now, you might say, well, OK, half have bank accounts. What if it's the successful half and that the poor half don't have bank accounts? Um, again, this doesn't seem to be the case. So you can see down here at the bottom of the map, um, the Emigrant Savings Bank is right there. And so. You see it's there in the sixth ward, which is the poorest ward in New York in the 1850s. And what is the, it's next to is the fourth ward, which is the second poorest ward. And those are the two most heavily Irish wards in the city. So the bank has a disproportionately large number of customers drawn from those two wards. So it overrepresented are really the poorer Irish immigrants and underrepresented are the kind of lace curtain Irish, if you will, though that term hadn't been invented yet, uh, who live further uptown. But then the final uh, thing that helps satisfy me that these immigrants are fairly representative, these bank customers, is that in recent years, um, economic historians have started writing algorithms to have computers do what I did so painstakingly for Peter Lynch and so forth. Have algorithms that will search through various census records and try to look for matches. And it'll compare people and their age and their birthplace and their spouse's name and their children's names and make links. And so those systems have done that. And they've found even that the famine Irish were even more upwardly mobile than what I'm going to present to you tonight. Now what you find with these algorithm links is that there's a decent number of errors. Probably 20% or so of the links aren't reliable at a minimum. So I think my figures that I'll give you tonight are a little more reliable. But what I have, according to the economic historians, their data, the famine Irish are even more upwardly mobile than what I'm going to tell you. So let's get to the story. So in order to in order to determine how upwardly mobile the famine immigrants were, we need to know where they start when they get to America. So one thing I did which hadn't been done before that I'm aware of is I created a database uh, that's composed of male famine Irish immigrants whose jobs we know within a year of their arrival in America. So I was able to find uh, almost a thousand of them. And this is the way in which their occupations break down. And so I created kind of what I call here an occupational hierarchy, but what in the book I call a, the Irish-American socioeconomic ladder. And so that's why I've organized it this way. So at the bottom rung of the ladder are the unskilled workers, people like day laborers, porters, and so forth. The next step up the ladder are peddlers. In the middle of the ladder are artisans, tradesmen, tailors, carpenters, shoemakers, things like that. The next level, sometimes I call them lower status white collar workers. I know Kevin doesn't like that. So uh, sometimes I call them clerks and civil servants. 
Um, I was lazy and they didn't change my slot. I should have thought of that and uh, changed it for Kevin to, to clerks and, and civil servants. Then almost at the top of the Irish American socioeconomic ladder of the 1850s were business owners. These are uh, number one saloon keepers, number two grocers, but they could be all sorts of businesses. And then at the very top, a rung that very, very few famine uh, immigrants could reach were professionals, doctors, lawyers, priests, uh, and so forth. So now that we know where the Irish start, and you can see nearly half are in the unskilled category when they arrive, when they get their first jobs in America. About a third are tradesmen. About 10% are able to get jobs as clerks. Um, very few are, are becoming civil servants immediately upon getting off their immigrant ship. But clerks, about 1 in 10, about 1 in 20, are able to start businesses almost immediately upon arrival. And then, of course, hardly any doctors and lawyers, though there, there are a few. So my talk for the rest of my, my uh, time with you tonight, I'm going to move up the socioeconomic ladder. So that's how we're going to organize our little look at this tonight. So we're going to start with um, the day labor. Oh, I should mention one thing, though, that uh, Kevin pointed out to me in an email, and so is <coughs> worth doubly emphasizing. What you have here, this breakdown shows you that the famine immigrants who are coming to New York are not a cross-section of the Irish population, right? A third of the Irish population was not skilled tradesmen, okay? And way more than 46% uh, would have been considered in the American context unskilled. So what this shows you and that we tend to forget is that the Irish who come to America during the famine are not a cross-section of the Irish population. Right? So the, the poorest people, a large number of those who were unskilled, couldn't afford to come to America. If they could afford to go anywhere, they could get as far as England. Right? So the group you're getting coming to America are more skilled than your cross-section of the Irish population, and they probably have more money than the cross-section of the population. And we tend to forget that. And uh, we tend to think, you know, and Americans looked at these immigrants, they said, oh my God, these are the poorest people ever to come to America. And that was true. But that doesn't mean that these were the poorest of Ireland's inhabitants, even though Americans looked at them and thought, well, these must be the poor, poorest of Ireland's inhabitants. The problem was Americans had no idea how much poverty there was in Ireland. All right, so getting back to our day laborers. Oh, there's one more thing I have to mention here. I'm going to be focusing here. The book doesn't do this so much, but I have 45 minutes, so not much time. I'm going to focus tonight on men and not women. We could talk about women, the women's socioeconomic ladder, but it's, it's, it's more like a step stool than a ladder for women, right? There are just very few jobs an Irish-born woman could have in New York. They could be a domestic servant, certainly. New Yorkers wanted them to do that. They could be a seamstress. They could maybe be a teacher, but it was really hard given their educations for famine immigrants to get jobs as teachers. Um, and then some become business owners, though usually in conjunction with a husband, sometimes a son, but usually a husband. Um, so their options are much more constricted. A woman who's ambitious to climb the socioeconomic ladder, the, mo the best thing she can do is marry someone who she thinks will be good at climbing the socioeconomic ladder. All right, so getting back to the men. Most day laborers did construction work, right? In theory, a day laborer could do just about anything that involves just hauling and carrying and digging. And notice that all the day laborers have their shovels with them. That was the prerequisite. You had to bring a shovel to the job, and that, gave, that gives you a good sense of what they were doing. Right, so today, on a construction site, all the digging and hauling and moving and hoisting is done by machinery. But in the 1850s, all the digging and moving and hoisting and hauling was done by Irish immigrants. Okay? They carried all the construction materials up rickety ladders that today is hoisted by those huge construction cranes you see everywhere. All the, fa all the uh, cellars that had to be dug, that are dug by power machinery now, were dug by these men with these shovels. 
Day labor didn't pay very much. It paid in those days pretty much always a dollar a day, though sometimes it was as little as 87 and a half cents a day. Um, in addition to it not paying very well, it was seasonal work. New York construction sites shut down in January and February. It was considered too cold, too snowy, too icy. And so there's basically no construction jobs in those two months. And so not only did it pay very low, but you also didn't have, you had to save money during the 10 months of the year to be able to get by in the two months you probably wouldn't. Now, not every unskilled person did day labor. And often networking was very important in getting one of these non-day labor jobs if you had no occupational skills. One of the fascinating examples of this I found through the bank records was the men who worked in the gas works, who came almost always from this one little town on the Dingle Peninsula called Castle Gregory. The gas works was the place in which the gas that lit New York City's gas lights was produced. That gas was produced by taking tons of coal, shoveling it into these huge furnaces, burning the coal at insanely high temperatures to produce the right gas that would then be uh, piped through the city to the city's gas lights. It was a terrible job, but it was so terrible that it paid better than a dollar a day, and so some people were willing to do it. And for whatever reason, it turns out that people from this one little town and its environs in the Dingle Peninsula end up dominating the unskilled workforce at the one at the biggest gas works in Manhattan, the New York Gas Works, which took up the entire block between First Avenue and Avenue A at a, like between 21st and 22nd Street. So it was an enormous facility. It was terrible work, but if you were from Castle Gregory or around there, when you got to New York and you probably went and stayed with somebody who was either kinsman or, or an acquaintance when you first arrived in New York, and you said, I need a job, what can I do? And they would say, oh, I can get you a job at the gas works. So every single gas worker who had an account among the tens of thousands of people at the Emigrant Savings Bank through 1860, every gas worker was from Castle Gregory or the surround, or, or some part of the parish that contained it. Now, it's such bad work, they don't work long there, and they end up spreading out all over the United States. But when you got to New York, if you were from Castle Gregory and or that parish, you ended up at the gas works for some period of time. Now, there was other less terrible work that you could get if you were unskilled that would pay more money. One was being a porter. Um, porters pay dependent on how hard you hustled, right? Because porters would go find somebody at a ferry terminal, say, I'll carry that for you, carry it wherever they were going, then they'd rush back to the ferry terminal and do that again and again and again. The faster you rushed, the longer the hours you worked, the more money you made. It also didn't hurt to have a winning personality so you could cajole somebody to take you among the various porters who were waiting there for work. So what we can see through the bank records is that porters, even though they have no more training than, than a, a day laborer, they save about 25% more in their bank accounts than day laborers do. Other unskilled Irish immigrants could earn even more. If you were successful as a porter, what you might do is take some of your savings and invest it in a horse and a cart. And if you didn't have enough to buy one, you could start out by renting a horse and cart. And there were other Irish immigrants who would rent you the course horse in the cart and rent you the space in, the sta in a stable if you bought a horse in a cart. And of course, a, a cartman is kind of like a porter who has somebody else to do the hauling. And again, it's a hustle job, right? The more times you show up at the workplace, the more jobs you, you find for yourself, the more money you make. And porters, I'm sorry, cartmen saved in their bank accounts 30% more than porters. So in some ways, you could say that, that cartmen are businessmen more than unskilled workers, right? So they, if they own their horse and cart, they've invested some capital in their business. Um, they have to be negotiators uh, and so forth. Um, but not wanting to, you know, and so I could make the argument, well, you should put cartmen into the businessmen's category. But wanting to be conservative, I, I've left them in the unskilled category. But you could make an argument that that's not where they belong.
Now, moving up the ladder, next we have peddlers. Oh, no, first I wanted to show you this. Um, how much upward mobility is there for the unskilled workers? It turns out quite a lot. So of the people who start out working in New York as in the unskilled category, 41% of them who I could track for 10 years or longer end up higher up the occupational ladder by the time they finish working or by the time I could no longer track them. So I thought that was pretty surprising, 41% moving up the ladder. So, uh, and as you can see, they don't move up just a little bit. Most of the people who move up move all the way up to the business owners category. And, th and that means they have a brick and mortar business, um, not say as a peddler uh, or as a cartman. So it seems that unskilled workers that rising from the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder was not something that was rare, and that the gains they made when they did rise weren't so slight as we might have imagined. One step up the ladder were peddlers, and quite a few Irish immigrants started out as, as peddlers. And anything you could buy in a brick and mortar store in New York, you could buy from a peddler on the street for a little bit less. Uh, here are some examples of Irish peddlers. There's a, hat, a, a used hat salesman. There's someone selling new umbrellas. That peddler would have, on sunny days, made the umbrellas himself in his tenement apartment, and then on rainy days, taken them out and sold them. There was specialization in peddling like there was with the gas men from Castle Gregory. One thing the bank records allow us to see is that among the peddlers who open accounts at the Emigrant Savings Bank, three quarters of them are from just one of the 32 Irish counties, County Donegal. And that's pretty amazing, 75% from just one of those 32 counties. And we don't know how, why Donegal ended up being the place where New York's Irish peddlers turn out to be from. It's not as if there were more peddlers in Donegal than any other county in Ireland. But it probably started out the same way that the gas workers ended up being from Castle Gregory. One person kind of started it, and then when more immigrants came and they said, what should I do? That person would say, oh, you should be a peddler like me. I'll show you how to do it. And then that snowballs and snowballs and snowballs until it, you end up with Donegal being the source of three quarters of the Irish peddlers in New York. Now, not all the Irish peddlers are from Donegal, however. Um, one kind of peddling was charcoal peddling. Every single charcoal peddler who opened an account at the Emigrant Savings Bank was from County Tyrone. Right? So that's here in Ulster, right, just to the east of Donegal. And almost all of the charcoal peddlers were not just from anywhere in Tyrone, but from one parish within Tyrone called Badoni uh, Lower. And this is an image of a, of a charcoal peddler. You sold it out of a cart like this and had a horse draw it, around, draw it around the city with you. And one of the interesting things about this networking that ended up with the concentration of charcoal peddlers being from this one place and other peddlers being from Donegal and gas men being from, from Castle Gregory is that these networks of Irish immigrants do much better than the median Irish immigrant. So, the peddlers from Donegal in their bank accounts save twice as much as the peddlers who aren't from Donegal. And the charcoal peddlers from Tyrone save twice as much money as other peddlers also. So there's a real benefit from joining one of these networks. Right? There's probably the fact that, you know, what we know is that some of the one of these charcoal peddlers moved to Jersey City and created what he called a charcoal factory, where he made the charcoal for the other immigrants to buy and use. Right? And maybe he gave a better price to his uh, people from Tyrone than to other people, and maybe that's what helped them. Certainly, the Tyrone immigrants could divvy up the territory of New York and not compete with each other, and that would help them also. So, moving up the ladder. Oh, this is, this is what that parish looks like now. It's, it's gorgeous in uh, Tyrone. The, the crazy thing is um, this mining company discovered right here, right where I'm looking at, gold underneath this valley. It's the biggest 
It's supposedly the biggest gold find in the world right now, like billions and billions of dollars worth of gold. And so this company wants to come and basically excavate the entire valley. And as you can imagine, most of the people in the valley don't like that, or don't want that, but then there are some who do because they want the jobs. And it's been held up in, in court for quite some time, but it's not clear. It's not clear what's going to happen to it. And then Northern Ireland getting uh, out of the EU is now further complicating it. So it's not clear where, what's going to happen. But I do know this summer I want to go back there and go hiking because who knows how long it's going to be that beautiful. Um, oh, and then in terms of peddler's mobility, about a third of peddlers move up the occupational ladder. Almost all of them become business owners. Right, that's good training, uh, peddling to become a, a, a shopkeeper. About a third stay peddlers their whole lives. And about a third move down the ladder. So there's not just upward mobility, there's downward mobility also. Although going from peddler to day labor isn't very far down. But one of the interesting things is that peddlers made a lot of money. The only people who saved more money in their immigrant bank accounts than peddlers were, and I want to make sure I get this right, were doctors, lawyers, saloon keepers, and policemen. Peddlers even save more money than grocers and all the other kinds of shopkeepers. So there's a lot of money in it, even though it's not a very prestigious occupation. Now let's move on to talk about artisans. This is a photograph of Hudson Street in about the period we're talking about. The Irish were in every skilled trade you could find in New York, just about, from auger maker and awning maker to wire puller and wood turner. But about 40% of the famine immigrants who could be categorized as artisans did one of four things, tailoring, shoemaking, carpentry, or masonry. More were tailors than any other thing. Um, on the left, there's an ad for one of the uh, emigrant bank's customers, a guy named George Fox. Um, George Fox became a very famous Irish tailor in New York City, in part because he was a shameless self-promoter. He had come to New York by himself, worked as a journeyman tailor for several years as an employee, making clothing for a, for a merchant tailor. Then he went back to, to Ireland, got his wife and his sons, and came back and opened a shop first on Chamber Street, just actually a few doors down from the Emigrant Bank, and then eventually on Broadway at a corner lot because he wanted to be as visible as possible. And as I said, he was a great self-promoter. He would brag in his ads, this is one of them on the left, about all his famous customers. This was slight exaggeration. They weren't exactly paying customers. What he would do is he would go to famous people, he'd show them fine uh, cloth, he'd say, I'll make you a suit for free. And Several of them said, sure. He made a suit for President Millmore, Millard Fillmore. He made a suit for Daniel Webster that he actually uh, wore when he was lying in state in the Capitol Rotunda when he died in 1852. Um, and then he would brag in his ads. I'm such a good tailor that Millard Fillmore is my customer. Daniel Webster is my customer. And this helped his sales. Um, Yet, he, there was a lot of bluster to, to Fox. Um, the R.G. Dunn & Company, which was a credit, uh, basically a credit reporting company that would report on the credit worthiness of business, of business owners to banks. They wrote up a report on Fox, and they called him, quote, a great brag who is prone to exaggeration. I love the way this one uh, credit reporter described it. I don't think our credit reports look like this. He says of Fox, quote, he is all bubbles and no soap, all sail and no ballast. He goes on to write that some considered Fox's bragging and eccentricity, but then he writes, quote, but others think him a bit deranged. Yet by the mid-1850s, a later uh, Dunn uh, investigator admitted that the, quote, tricky Irishman is doing a considerable business. He gets up a fashionable and tasty garment that is popular in style. So most Irish tailors learned their occupation in Ireland. But some only learned their trades after they got to New York. And one example of this was Morocco dressing. 
So Morocco was the term used to describe fake leather made of goat skin rather than calf skin or cow skin. And Irish immigrants get into the Morocco, uh, the Morocco dressing business. And this is an example here on the, on the left. Oh, the pixelation is terrible. On the left is a guy who's, who's uh, shaving the, the goat hair off the goat skin. And then you, you, you sew the goat skins up into these balloons and you blow the balloons up and then you float them in this henna and that turns, that, that uh, 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 dyes the goat skin and then that would be used for the binding for cheap books and things, or, or of cheap furniture. This is another trade in which the Irish concentrated. Most of the Morocco dressers born in Ireland in New York came, again, from one parish in one county. And this was, again, in Donegal, but in this case, in southeastern Donegal in the Stranorlar parish. And again, we don't know how this started, but probably one immigrant got trained. He then started training his friends, and so on and so forth. Now, we, we can infer that there was discrimination against Irish uh, entering some trades. For example, a big trade in New York at this time was shipbuilding. And yet, there are virtually no Irish immigrant shipbuilders. And so that leads one to imagine that there had to be discrimination playing a role here, that, the sh that uh, those who did shipbuilding refused to train or hire Irish immigrants because there's no other ex way to explain how they can be so absent from this trade, but so numerous in virtually every other. Now, in terms of the mobility of tradesmen, um, you find, as we see here, about two thirds of those who start out in New York as artisans remain artisans their whole lives. About a quarter move up and most of those who move up become shopkeepers. So you might be a tailor who opens a, a uh, clothing shop. You might be a shoemaker who opens a shoe shop, so on and so forth. This is the hardest transition to trace. And I'll give you one example of this. I have uh, one immigrant who I traced named Robert Armstrong. He works as a painter in New York for a decade and then moves to Milwaukee. And in every census in Milwaukee, he gives his occupation as painter. I was only able to find out that he actually owned his own paint shop because he died in a very unusual way. I found this in a Milwaukee newspaper. It said Robert Armstrong, painter, died the other day uh, at the back of his paint shop. He'd gone back to use the outhouse. He fell through the seat into the vault. So this is the kind of outhouse that did, wasn't connected to a sewer. There was a vault. The urine and feces would collect in there for months and months, and then every once in a while, you would pay somebody to cart it away. He fell in there. He was 70 years old at this point. Um, and the coroner said that he didn't die of the fall, that he asphyxiated on the fumes in the vault. So it was only from finding that news story that I learned that this guy who called himself a painter his whole life was actually a paint shop proprietor and a painting contractor rather than a painter. So undoubtedly, I've missed other artisans who moved up the ladder. Now let's talk briefly about civil servants. There aren't a whole lot of them, and clerks and civil servants. But in fact, one out of every six famine immigrants worked in this category at some point in their lives. This is, the, this is the category that had the most upward mobility of all. More than half of the people who started out as clerks in New York ended up moving up higher, mostly to business owners, but quite a few into, into the professions, especially lawyers. Just quickly give you two examples of this. One was this fellow, Hubert Glynn, whose story is, I think, really interesting. He started going to college in Ireland before deciding that the economic prospects of a college graduate during the famine were so grim that he would come to America instead. Um, but having a college, some college education, he wanted to get a job that was commensurate with his background. And so he looked for a, an office job. And he found that the Irish Emigrant Society was looking for a clerk, and in particular, a clerk who spoke Irish. 
because they had a lot of Irish immigrants who did not speak English come to their offices looking for help finding jobs or places to live. And so because he was both uh, literate, had a, wrote, a, wrote a very nice uh, hand, and could speak Irish, they hired him. A few years later, New York State decided they needed to have a central place where all immigrants would be processed when they landed in New York. This was 1855 when they opened Castle Garden, which had been a big theater at the, on a, built on an artificial island at the very southern tip of Manhattan. And they turned it into the first New York immigrant reception center, right? the, pre, the precursor of Ellis Island. The state was looking for somebody who could oversee all the collection of the data they would collect from the immigrants coming in. The Emigrant Society recommended Herbert, Hubert Glynn. And so when, when Castle Garden opened in 1855, Hubert Glynn was the person put in charge of all the clerks who sat at tables like you can see there in the bottom right and took down from each uh, arriving immigrant information about them. Unfortunately, all the Castle Garden records burned in a fire at Ellis Island in uh, the 1890s. So we don't have any of Hubert Glynn's work. Um, but he worked there for um, 35 years, his entire life, uh, or the entire rest of his life. On the other hand, other people got clerical jobs um, moving up from other levels. Often the civil service jobs were kind of a thank you. That was the case for uh, Colonel James Cavanaugh who was uh, one of the officers of the 69th Regiment, which became famous fighting in the, in the Civil War. By the way, Marion, was there, there was a portrait behind the screen there of someone from the 69th. Who is that? Do you know? Michael Corcoran. That's Corcoran? Oh, all right. So Michael Corcoran was the head of the, of the Irish Brigade when it first went to, to fight in the Civil War. He got captured at Bull Run. And so people started moving up the uh, officers list pretty quickly, and one of them who moved up as a result was Kavanaugh. And so Kavanaugh, by the time they fight the Battle of Fredericksburg at the end of 1862, is um, in charge of the entire 69th Regiment. He serves throughout the entire war, uh, manages not to get killed like so many other members of the 69th. Um, and after the war, he goes back to doing what he had done before the war, which was being a carpenter. His carpentry, he's a journeyman carpenter even. Not, it doesn't even own his own. He tries to open a carpentry business. It doesn't go well. So many New Yorkers uh, love Kavanaugh. They served under him that they use their political influence as Kavanaugh gets older to get him a civil service job so he can put down his, his hammer and nails and have an easier time of it. And they get him a job in the Brooklyn uh, Custom House where he serves as a clerk. Um, and. So that's often the way that uh, Irish immigrants would come to these jobs. And quite a few veterans get those civil service jobs as kind of thanks for their service. So finally, we're going to talk about business owners. And I know I've, yes, I'm up to my 45 minutes. So I'm going to be very brief with the business owners. I could, the business owner stories are so fascinating. They're just endlessly Amazing, just just so much so that you know I would think if I if if I could get Scorsese to do another movie, if I would present him some of these stories of these business owners, he would say no, that no one would believe it if I if I if I said that. So I'll just tell I'll just tell two of these uh, no one would believe it stories. One is this guy Lawrence Callanan. He is from a market town in County Cork. Um, as a teenager, he works for his father, who's a grocer. Um, he goes to the city of Cork to do some business for his father. Um, he's sent there. But before he goes, he, he, do, he does something bad. And his father says, when you get home, you're in trouble. So young Lawrence decides, I don't want to find out what that is. He goes and conducts his business, gets some money, uh, conducts some transaction, gets some money in the transaction, puts most of the money in an envelope and mails it to his father, takes the rest of the money, buys himself a ship ticket, and gets on a ship and sails to America. <laughs> um, he arrives in New York. He's 17. He has no money. He moves in with an aunt. But he has experience working as a grocer's clerk. So he gets a job as a grocer's clerk. What he finds out is 
that so many people want to be grocer's clerks and learn the grocery business that pays actually less than being a day laborer. Um, he eventually saves in his emigrant savings bank account $150. And he takes that money and opens a grocery. It's kind of amazing. You could open a grocery in Manhattan for $150. And even if you adjust that for inflation, where we're talking today, that's you know, maybe the equivalent of five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 at the most. And that was all it took. He starts a grocery. It doesn't do very well. He like, doesn't lose money, but he's not making much money. And one of the people he had clerked for sees this and says, you know, you're not doing very well there, but I could really use a smart guy like you to be my junior partner in my wholesale grocery business. And so he agrees to do that, and he works for this guy, uh, Peter Lynch, and eventually Lynch retires and Callanan buys him out, and Callanan becomes a wholesale grocer. And you can see one of his ads here. And Callanan becomes a famous lower, lower New York figure, in part because he's very litigious, he sues a lot of people, He's also very prominent in the Catholic Church and, and a very big donor to the Catholic Church. But he starts out with nothing in New York other than his you know, experience as a grocer's clerk and becomes a, a quite wealthy wholesale grocer. Then here's another of these stories, uh, Andrew Kerwin. He starts out as a plasterer, which had been his father's trade, and he works himself up to being a master plasterer, meaning he, he bids on jobs for builders, and then he becomes a builder himself. At first, he does pretty well at this, but builders work mostly on credit. If, you're, if the economy suddenly turns bad and you can't pay your debts, you can have your property seized. And that was what happened to Kerwin in 1878 at the end of the, of the depression that started after the Panic of 1873. Uh, he declares bankruptcy, and his debts are the equivalent today to about $75 million. But he apparently negotiates deals with his creditors, and he's able to get back into the building business. And he becomes successful because he comes with this, up this, with this idea. He says, you know, nobody wants to live by the rivers in New York, right? That's where all the noxious businesses are. That's where the brothels are. What if we could clean that up a little? So he and, and a couple of partners buy up all of Avenue A in the East 50s, and they rename it Sutton Place, something fancy. And then there's a part even closer to the river that, they, that, that, that Kerwin names Riverview Terrace, and he builds there. And so they build Sutton Place, and it turns into eventually, so I can see some of you, some of you are not, but some of you are old enough in this audience to remember when Sutton Place was a swank address in Manhattan. Um, and so he's the one who helps does that. And he, he doesn't, you know, if he held on to that property, he'd have made a lot more money. But still, he ends up doing fine in the end and becoming fairly wealthy. So here is Riverview Terrace, my favorite part. Each townhouse in Riverview Terrace has an actual terrace overlooking now the 59th Street Bridge. Um, just to give you an idea of how desirable these things became, this one, the one at the end here, number one Riverview Terrace, which is. This was so considered such a swank address that by the 1920s, the Warner of one of the Warners of Warner Brothers Studios bought number one Riverview Ferret Terrace from the Kerwin family. And then eventually it changed hands, and the guy who created the Dallas Cowboys football team, not Jerry Jones, the current owner, but the, the previous one he moved into One Riverview Terrace in the 1970s. And so those are considered some of the most gorgeous houses, small houses in all of New York. Oh, I wish I had time to tell this story. Um, I'm going to You You sure? All right. Um, so three Morgan brothers move to New York during the, the famine. And they're, they're teenagers, um, but too old. One of the things I did with my study is, if you were young enough to go to school when you got to New York, I don't consider you part, because if you went to school and got a New York schooling, that makes you a different kind of person than someone who arrives and has to go to work right away. And you're going to have a lot more upward mobility uh, possibility if you have an American schooling versus not. 
So in terms of upward mobility, I only look at people who we know get to America and have to go to work right away. That's the case for these three Morgan brothers who are all teens when they arrive in New York and some of the people who we can immediately see in the census working. One of them um, apparently has training and goes to work as a printer. The other two go to work as stable boys, mucking out stables. They, they, the two who muck out stables uh, room with some, uh, the stable is owned by a guy who also owns a uh, beverage business, brewing root beers, sarsaparilla, ginger beer, those kinds of things. And so the Morgan brothers who work in the stables room with the employees who work at the brewing place. And apparently that's how they get into the brewing and learn how to make root beers. This is on the east side. So then they quit there and they move to the west side and they start their own root beer, sarsaparilla, and bottled water business. It's hard to imagine that in the 1850s people wanted to buy bottled water. But in addition to the root beers, they actually sold bottled water, uh, carbonated bottled water. They start their business. They do pretty well. This is, this is not an actual Morgan brother, but this would have been how the Morgan brothers went around their, uh, the west side of New York selling their root beers to uh, restaurants and shops. They do well enough that the brother who's the printer says, I'm not going to be a printer anymore. And he gets into the beverage business too. But the two brothers, for whatever reason, say, no, you're not going to be part of us. And so he has to start his own. He becomes a hard cider maker and has a separate business. Um, you know, well, you know how brothers can be. So <laughs> the two got along. And they apparently didn't get along with the third one. So they compete with each other for about a decade. In fact, more than a decade. But then what happens is the two who run the root beer business, they decide, you know, we're so good at this now. We have our employees. This doesn't take our full time. We're going to start a moving and storage business, too. And this is something that's really important to realize about these immigrants, right? These are super ambitious people. They have one successful business, and they say, eh, I could have two successful businesses. And they go and start another one. So these guys are successful, wealthy, politically connected, and they start a second business in moving and storage. Um, and they sell the root beer business to the other brother. Um, the amazing thing about this story, I think, is the fact that both these businesses, the soda business and the moving business, are still in existence in New York today. So Morgan and Brothers, if you look up, if you Google moving Manhattan, one of the first things that comes up is Morgan Manhattan Movers, which is this company 175, you know, 150 years later. And the root beer business, they eventually uh, bought up a Minnesota soda company that was called White Rock. And they merged them. And they put their facilities in Queens. And White Rock beverages still exist and are still made in Queens. What's that? They were known for uh, hiring Irish forever down to the 20th century. That's right. And, so that, and that's their Irish origins. So um, just two of the many. Uh, business stories I could tell you. And I could tell you, I could give a whole 45 minute lecture just about saloon keepers, but I put this up here just to remind you that the saloon keepers were considered the top of the heap for business owners. That was what the Irish immigrants aspired to be, were saloon keepers more than anything else. And you can see why looking at the bank records, because saloon keepers saved more money than anybody except doctors and lawyers. All right, so. Oh, and here are some saloon keepers, but I'll skip over them to get to the final, uh, the next to the final slide, which is, so overall, how much, to what extent did the Irish move up the socioeconomic ladder? Um, this shows you the Irish when they arrive, and then the final known occupation of these same people. Okay? So what you find is only 25% of them are still in the unskilled category by the time they end their working careers. Um, the number of art, the percentage of artisans has gone down a little. Um, and of course, the one that's gone up a lot there is business owners, from 5% to a third of all the famine Irish. So you know, I think that's pretty good evidence that this whole idea that the famine Irish 
did not have much possibility of upward mobility, that they were stuck in poverty, uh, is just not borne out. What we find is that the famine Irish had a lot more control over their fates than we've imagined. Um, they networked assiduously to improve their opportunities and pay and working conditions. And they changed jobs frequently, uh, often moving to where the best opportunities could be found. Second, what we see is that the famine immigrants were a lot more entrepreneurial than we've realized. Many more of them opened small businesses than we've understood. Immigrants before and since the famine Irish have found self-employment to be the surest route to advancement, in part because it helps you avoid the discrimination you might face at the hands of, of native-born employers. And then finally, what you find is that there was a lot more occupational mobility than we have grasped. Sure, it's true that 25% of the famine Irish start at the bottom rung of the socioeconomic ladder and end their lives there. But the remaining 75% either climb to a more prestigious level or never were on the bottom rung to begin with. So it turns out that the situation of John Lane was, in fact, more common than that of Dennis Sullivan. More male famine immigrants ended their lives running businesses than doing day labor. And for some, that meant running a farm like Peter Lynch. A farm is really a business. You have to invest capital and you have to sell goods. But far more operated saloons or groceries or other urban businesses. Now, none of this is meant to deny that life for the famine immigrants was hard. It was very hard. Um, family members died all the time. Workplace fatalities were common. But despite their lack of capital, their lack of education, and the constant specter of discrimination, the famine Irish did find the United States to be a plentiful country. Thank you. Yes, so I'm happy to take questions. Yes, in the red vest. Oh, you have a microphone? Yes, we pass mics around both rooms. Thank you very much. Hi, that was really terrific. Thank you and for making it so interesting with those biographies of people. Um, I had the pleasure six years ago of taking uh, an MA course here with Professor Casey and we, she put it, she tortured us with spreadsheets uh, developing uh, on these uh, records. Thank, thank you, it was very interesting. Um, and Hazia Diner also has mined this sort of area, particularly with the peddlers who are Jewish. My question is, what did the Irish do for capital? Because it seemed the Jewish folks were able to self, uh, you know, so, serve themselves with capital. Did we have a similar system? Did we have bankers apart from the immigrants uh, bank? So the an that's a good question with a complicated answer that I'm going to oversimplify for the sake of, of brevity. Um, so the number one way in which the famine Irish would capitalize their businesses was definitely through saving, right? So you would work and save money and the, the fam you know, one of the, I hate to call it this, but one of the advantages of having lived in such terrible conditions in Ireland was that it became fairly easy to not be tempted to buy all the things you could buy in New York and put aside savings. Um, and so the immigrants save money really quickly. And then as we saw with the case of uh, Mr. Callan, and, you know, you could start a business with $150 and so, that was by far the, the number one way. But the other way was through, and this is, a, this is a topic that for the Irish is, in this period, is basically unstudied. But we know that the Irish who did well lent to the Irish who were up and coming. So the pre-famine Irish immigrants who had been in New York a while and often had saved a lot of money and would lend money to other immigrants. And that was a way that, another way in which, so the peddlers would come and they would you know, borrow to get their first stock of goods to peddle and pay that back their loan that way. And so, and with Peter Lynch, for example, Peter Lynch, in, all the way in Minnesota, he was a big money, you know, we know from his will that he'd lent out money to lots of his neighbors. And he's charging a high interest rate too, so clearly there wasn't a lot of competition uh, for, for loans in those days. And so, so loaning to each other and saving, that, that's the quick answer. Cormac? 
I'll pass the mic to you. I had grabbed it. You can pass it back to me later. <laughs> Uh, y yes, uh, excellent, I want to say. Um, uh, I noticed that there was no policeman and uh, fire and all of the other. W would they have been under uh, civil clerk uh, capacity? Because certainly we've heard that one of the avenues of success and establishment was uh, that they'd get off the boat and they'd uh, sometimes go into uh, policemen or firemen and things like that. And, and just another a brief comment, if you could. All of this sounded very fancy, or no, not fancy, upward growth. But co comment just a little bit about how those who were way above them were looking at even these Irish, uh, which goes back to how they were perceived within American society, even though you're saying that they were a success within their Irish American community. Right, two good, two good points there. Um, so in terms of the, the first one, right, the book has lots about policemen um, and some about firemen. The, so in this period that I'm writing, the famine period, firemen is still an entirely volunteer job. So in my last chapter where I talk about the children of the famine immigrants, there are a lot of firemen because by that point it's a, it is a civil service job. So yeah, I've for my purposes of upward mobility, I've put policemen in the civil servants category. And you can easily justify that when you look at the savings of policemen. So if you look at immigrant bank customers, the four highest savers were doctors, lawyers, saloon keepers, and number four was policemen. And I'm talking even in the famine period, not the later period. So already that's not only a prestigious job within the Irish American community, but it's also very remunerative because not only did you get your salary, but in those days, if you had something stolen and the police said, ah, oh, we're never gonna find that. You would often go hire a policeman to actually go dig into it more than the official police were willing to. And so you could make extra, you know, there was a lot of moonlighting opportunities. You know, today we think of police moonlighting as like security guards at nightclubs. That wasn't the moonlighting back then. It was private detective work. That was the big thing. And so policemen made a lot. And then there was probably political payments for policemen also, so it's various ways you could make money. And then what was the second point? The attitude from American society. Oh, right. Right, so absolutely, you could be at the pinnacle of the Irish American community and still be looked down upon by the native-born American community. And that's why I tried, to the extent possible, to always remember to call this the Irish-American socioeconomic ladder and not the American ladder because that would get much more complicated. But in terms of the Irish-American community, uh, I think the way I've organized things is sensible. But yeah, you, you see very often natives frown upon Irish no matter how successful they might be. Uh, Tyler, thank you firstly for um, communicating all of this. Uh, I, I mean, I know the amount of archival and quantitative work uh, that went on to produce these results and for uh, communicating them to our audience this evening and uh, the way you did. I have a question for you is, um, you mentioned um, towards the end of the five po uh, points book, uh, you revised the conclusion a little bit as the records were coming out and as you were talking to Mary and Casey um, about the, uh, you had this inkling of the extent of uh, upward social mobility that might be there. And so you know, the overall picture you, you give uh, pushes against what's sometimes called the gloom and doom school uh, of interpretation. And, um, for those who might be attached to a little bit of gloom and doom, <laughs> there, uh, do, have you encountered uh, pushback? Or I could maybe phrase the same question in another way, which is simply to ask you, were you surprised uh, by what you found through this analysis? Um, what were some of the surprises? Um, I was totally shocked at how much upward mobility there was. I didn't expect to find this much. Um, and in truth, I really, I started on this really just looking at the savings. That was all I was interested in, was how much they saved. But of course, once I got to that, then I wondered, well, how did, 
how did someone who in, you know, how did Peter Lynch, who's a day laborer listed there, you know, maybe he's not a good example, but you would find people who, who open a bank account, they're a day laborer, and 20 years later, they have a lot of money in their bank account. So I wondered, how was that possible? And that sent me to Ancestry.com and the New York Public Library website with the city directories, and I'd see, oh, well, that person was a day laborer, and then they were a clerk, and then they opened a grocery, and that explains it. And then that made me start wondering, well, maybe there was, you know, I had no reason to doubt the story that the Irish were locked in poverty and locked in, in you know, at the bottom of the occupational ladder. Uh, it was just these records that kept shouting at me, no, there's, there's more to the story than that. So, uh, who has the, how about, yes, you there in, in the blue, yes. And then after you, I'll go to this room. Hi, thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind kind of expanding on the relationship between these business owners and uh, growing Fenianism in the Americas. Like, I know that there was this this uh, real, like, powerful nationalist epicenter, uh, even as nearby as literally Union Square. Um, how do these famine immigrants figure in, uh, if they do figure in, or were they were they Americans that tried to forget their uh, difficult past in, in the famine. So, the short answer is I don't know a whole lot about that. What I do find is that quite a few of these, if they live to the 18th century, so I can't trace most of these people, very many of them to the 1870s. Those who I do trace there, you often find when the newspapers have accounts of Fenian meetings that their names are listed. Um, you know, if they're an officer. But the problem is if you were a rank and file member, your name wouldn't make it into the paper, although every once in a while they'd do, you know, a fundraising thing and they'd list all the people who gave money. And then you could see everybody in theory. Um, and so their names pop up there all the time. Um, but, but the answer is I, I don't know uh, because the records become, become kind of difficult to, uh, to trace. The record becomes difficult. Thank you so much. Question from this room. How about you, yeah, with the microphone back there? Uh, I have two questions, and I apologize if they're more about second generation. The first is, can you speak at all to union membership and if Irish immigrants were able to take advantage of that and our political patronage? And secondly, the relationship between uh, famine Irish and self-emancipated or just black New Yorkers in general, seeing as they both were sort of refugees. Sure. Thank you. Over here. Um, in terms of labor unions, um, there's very, very little li evidence of Irish, of the famine Irish joining unions in the 1850s and 60s, just because joining, a, you know, it was, it was for the most part illegal. There were working men's organizations, but unions in the modern sense that would try to negotiate pay, you would get thrown in jail if you tried to do that. So there's not much evidence of that. And, and that also is something that you see more of in the next generation. And then the other question was about, oh, the relationship with the Irish and, and black New York? Right, so that's, that's a great question. Um, I did very little work on that for this book because this book was focused on, on kind of social climbing, as, as it were. Um, I actually, my, my I, as, Kevin mentioned I retired a couple of years ago uh, as a professor at George Washington University. My very last PhD student is defending his dissertation later this month, and it's on the relationship between Irish Americans and, and African Americans in the second and third biggest cities in America at that point, which were Philadelphia and Baltimore. So uh, the answer, uh, and his answer in his dissertation, is that the relationship is complicated. <laughs> would be the best way to put it. Um, what's best known is the antagonism epitomized by the New York City draft riots, but what's often there is, is actually uh, close and, and uh, benevolent relationships that we don't tend to hear that much about, though he's dug this up for his dissertation. But not much I can, I can't really say much about that at, at this point. Um, does someone over here have the microphone? We should maybe alternate. And then if in the meantime, that room can get the next person a microphone. We'll take, we'll take two more questions. So we okay. Don't, we don't sure. 
Firstly, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you for all your research. I'm just curious, you know, this is exhaustive research on New York. Is there a similar parallel narrative to Boston Famine Irish and how they moved up socially? So there, there probably is. There must be. Um, so one thing I found, um, you know, I didn't have time for it uh, tonight, um, but the last chapter of my book talks about the Irish who leave New York and go other places. One interesting thing is the Irish who left New York never went to Boston. It was really weird. And they didn't go to Philadelphia. They would go like any place except Boston or Philadelphia. Um, but the Irish who leave New York do better than the Irish who stay in New York. That's like constant and it's always the case. I mean, with some you know, exceptions, we have some people I didn't have a chance to talk about today who do really well in New York. Um, but on average, you're much more likely to do well if you leave New York and you can buy real estate, which is too expensive for almost everyone to buy in New York, but not that expensive in all the rest of the country. So I, I imagine the story has to be pretty similar. Um, but Boston, unfortunately, didn't have an institution equivalent to the Emigrant Savings Bank. Philadelphia did, um, and their records are available um, but they're not as detailed as the immigrant record. So they only list your name, your occupation, and what county in Ireland you're from, and nothing more than that. So you can't use those records to then do the tracing that we're able to do with the immigrant bank customers. So I think it must be the same, but we don't know. Who's got the microphone over here? Anybody? You want to hand him the microphone here? Uh, simple question, did, uh, knowing that this group was prospering perhaps more than expected, did they send money home and I wondered back to Ireland and may, maybe that had an effect or a mitigating effect if they were sending significant sums back home? Yes, they're definitely sending millions and millions of dollars back to Ireland uh, and unfortunately we don't have great records of that. We know some, but not all, of the amounts that were being sent. And so, but we know, and in fact, this is a picture, if you could read the caption there, it says, this is in 1879, and it says, Irish depositors of the immigrant bank withdrawing money to send to the suffering relatives in the old country. Just curious, how would one, you didn't physically put money in an in a envelope and send it. Could you wire yeah. money? Well, so you could go to the, in this case, the emigrant bank, and the emigrant bank had corresponding banks in Europe. By 1879, there's, a, there's an Atlantic telegraph cable, and, you could, and the bank would actually telegraph the orders uh, for money. Uh, but before that, it would go on a ship. The physical money wouldn't go on a ship, but um, the orders would go, and there would be, the banks would settle up with each other in, in some other way. So, uh, Tyler, you've given us, uh, from my perspective, a, a perfect lecture for Glaxham and Ireland House. Um, we'll invite everybody to continue the conversation downstairs, and thank you so much.